four, three, two, one. Hi, June. How are you doing? Hello, Rob. I'm okay. How are you? I'm, I'm considering the circumstances. I'm, I'm, I'm quite well, thank you. So, um, could you please tell tell our listeners um, a bit about yourself, your your past decades in various niches of education? Decades is definitely right because I'm certainly getting older. Um, I'd like to think in lockdown, I'm just trying to stay one age. Uh, so I've been a primary music teacher for something like 25 years, or maybe more actually, maybe 20. Oh. <laughs> and um, also uh, an instrumental specialist teacher and a graded music examiner as well. I see. And um, you were head of an organisation which used to employ me for six years. Uh, yes, not that was interesting. Not could you tell, tell us about that organisation, please? Yes, so I was the quality and strategy manager, head of music education for the Every Child Musician programme which was an initiative of the London Borough of Newham. Um, yeah, and that's where I employed you. Yes, um, and it all went downhill from there. Anyway, so to my, my, my um, which sort of puts my own qualifications in the shade, but my attempt at that would be, I, I worked for June for like six years, going from school to school, primary school, secondary schools in East London, like East Town, West Town, Plasto, Stratford. Is that how you pronounce it, Plasto? Is that right? Plasto, I say Plasto, yeah. Cluster. Yeah, grim, grim place. Um, <laughs> so, thank you for your time. I was gonna just, I was gonna start with some facts that, as mm -hmm. as of today, the Independent. Yeah. I don't know if you close as I can get to a trustworthy fact source. The Independent <laughs> headline: uh, An epi epidemiology professor says, "Quote: Nobody's got any idea, any idea what best strategy to use regarding the lockdown and when it's going to be lifted in schools and houses." Uh, the Telegraph reported Boris Johnson saying primary schools will open on June 1st, which June you might be happy to know about, but it is a conditional plan, which you may be less happy about. Um, and if they, if they do reopen, it will be with year one reception and year six only, and maybe some secondary pupils. Um, on the 23rd of March, the UK officially announced the lockdown. 16th of April, Dominic Raab announced it would continue at least another three weeks into May. They say lifting too soon would damage the economy, if whatever that, whatever's left of it. Uh, the 27th of April, Boris Johnson urged public patience. He said he admitted we've given up ancient and basic freedoms. Um, today's news is no one knows about the lockdown. Professor Richard Dingwall, part-time professor at the School of Sciences at Nottingham Trent University, social sciences, sorry, and a pandemic disease expert, says, quote, premature for any responsible scientist to start speculating about when it will end. And today is May the 11th. So June, from what you've seen, how has it been affecting schools and the education in general in the UK or worldwide? Well, yeah, definitely worldwide. Um, certainly for schools that I'm aware of, uh, particularly in East London and just London in general, um, some seem to have really been able to get on board with the whole online teaching. Um, and right. that's been going well for some schools. And there's others that it just doesn't seem to be their remit. And I think they're still holding out for the fact that they're expecting kids to come back pretty soon. You have got the course with parents that it's difficult for them to play the role of the teacher at home. For some parents it is. There's a big sort of socio-economic divide there. And there's some that are really engaged with it and are playing that role of the teacher at home with their kids all day. And there's others that probably have to, you know, give up the battle after a few hours because it's difficult to. I would imagine, I don't know, but I would imagine that the sort of core subjects of, you know, the maths, English, science are going ahead as best as they can. Um, what we should be concerned about is the other subjects that make the child the whole, uh, the humans that we want to be, that we want to see in the future. And that would obviously be the sort of um, social well-being, care, health, mental health of course which i know you're very passionate about talking um and also from my perspective music and art in general and just being creative because kids are creative you know if you give a kid a paintbrush and something yeah. they'll do something with it if you give them an instrument they'll make some sounds with it so i'm wondering how yeah. that's going on at home even with the best will in the world of schools trying to deliver that right yeah my in my experience um 
kids that have said, or adults that have said in their 60s, um, that they don't enjoy music is because they were bored out of it, or, or, or scared out of it, less likely, but bored out of it by a boring teacher, forcing mm -hmm. them to learn bar when they're seven, on, you know, ruthlessly on the violin. Uh, it's interesting what you're saying about people coming into into home into homeschooling. Do you think that do you think there could be a silver lining in that it's re, it's reconnecting families and less information is coming from the state as opposed to loved yeah. ones? Absolutely, in creative families that are willing, if they've got the space to, even if you haven't got a garden. I mean, I live in a flat, but even if you haven't got a garden, if you're willing to sort of go outside and find leaves on the floor and oh what can we make with this what can we do with this um yeah. whether it's listening to bird songs i mean i live in southeast london and there's um green i think they're parakeets that fly around in the garden and they're quite amazing when you actually tune in and you listen to it and say oh wait a minute i can't hear a police car going past i can't hear the buses going past but i can hear the birds in the garden so there will be families that can really tap into that and and enjoy that time with their children i am aware of a couple of um, people that i know quite well that are struggling to keep their kids for want of a better word entertained or to actually draw that out of themselves so perhaps that's another way that schools could try supporting parents not just saying here's the lesson plan this is what they're meant to be learning two plus two equals four it's whether they can actually Really, the teachers that are providing this in schools, it's whether they can actually almost do a teacher training for parents. Yeah, well, that parent training would be would be, would be in my top <laughs> three if I, if I had to, to devise a, a curriculum. Yes, a lot of parents uh, so need training. <laughs> That's for sure. How else do you think the um, the lockdown in the UK has affected family dynamics? To mental health, look at their mental health lens, the family dynamics, and and how that will, and how that will, and how do you think that could? Obviously, it's fool's errand to predict the future, but how how it could springboard um, into a new kind of culture in educa education, and what that culture might be like if everyone's scared to go near each other. Okay, I'll try and answer all of that. Um, I think. For general family dynamics, I'm hoping that for most people, they're actually enjoying their time at home, enjoying their families. Uh, there will be some that are not. There will be some that will be questioning why they even married that person, perhaps. Um, you know, because yeah. you, might, <laughs> you might spend all day at work, you might spend Saturday, um, I don't know, playing tennis or going out or something, and you might actually find that you don't normally spend that much time with your partner, including your children. So there will be some that are really questioning, okay, how did I get into this? You know, what is going on here? Hopefully there's not too many of that. In terms of... Yeah, the whole, yeah sorry, go on, go on. No, no, in terms of the health and well-being, I mean, my concern for children is, is that, I mean, I'm an only child, so I played quite happily on my own at home. I was fine. Um, and there are children that are homeschooled, and so you could say that they have less contact with children. But this whole... Yeah. A humanity level is lost with teaching at the moment. I would appreciate, I'm going to make some presumptions on that. Just the way if children are upset, you can um, turn that around in a school, in a classroom. So you'll remember this, uh, Rob. You taught in some very uh, challenging environments, to say the least, and we won't name those schools or those places indeed, but you certainly did teach in some really challenging situations. Now, there are times when an experienced teacher can turn that around. You can see a child becoming upset, unruly, unwhatever. So you make a number of decisions as a teacher to what to do. You either choose to ignore low level, um, you know, interference or you praise that child or you find, uh, for want of a better word, the kid that might cause a few issues. You praise that child and you give that child jobs. Now, how a parent managing to do that now and how will that affect children I mean this is just one particular angle I'm taking on what you've asked how will that affect children when they go back into school in September and we all need that feel of human touch um and they're kind of missing out on that you know whether it's running around the playground playing tag hiding behind a tree or whatever it's the fact that they're possibly missing out on that with children of their own age and that yeah, it feels to me no. like everything, including everything, including that, is is decaying, and 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 I think we get used to things surprisingly quickly, and we forget how things yes. used to be surprisingly 
quickly. And um, we're doing a lot of unweaving, invisible unweaving of the social fabric right now. Uh, yes. That might not be so yes. easy to to re to uh, to um, reweave. Um, okay. So, how else do you think schools might be after this? After this, uh, might they be afraid of human touch? Might they be afraid of contact? I saw um, a school in, I think it's in Hong Kong, actually. I can't be entirely sure now. Um, the children were creative, but some of them are in school. And this is, I guess, reception or possibly year one. And they've made these hats with, you know, like those kind of sausage balloons that were out. And the sausage balloons yeah. came out so far that um, it was whatever it was, the two metres or whatever the advice is. Imagine being a five-year-old and, and starting to learn that you can't touch that. You can't touch that person. You can't go because kids do. I mean, it's I, how they're yeah. you know, I can't imagine what, I want to say damage that or what that's putting into a child's mind. You know, we could end up seeing, depending on how long this goes on for, we could end up seeing 20 years in the future Possibly some, I don't want to say damaged children, that's awful, but we could see some situations where, in like I say, in 25 years' time, people are talking, therapists are talking about relationships that people are having trouble being, whether it's intimate or loving or caring, you know, because that is our nature, I think, I hope. It's strange because familiarity breeds contempt and uh, isolation breeds um, fragility and insanity. Um, that reminds me of, another, of the, something else I forgot to say that makes me sound clever. Um, professor of Epidemiology of Infectious Diseases at the University of, Not the University of Nottingham says um, it's most likely we'll be in and out of lockdown uh, over the coming months, even years, and that there's a real worry about giving people false hope um, that it's, that it's going to be all right on June 1st, you know, which June has got a nice ring to it. That's really concerning. If we are in lockdown for some significant time, this is going to have such an effect on society. And all right, I'm old enough and ugly enough to be able to deal with this. But I still think about children. <laughs> I still think about the kids and, and young people. I mean, I had a, a big birthday recently, a big number, won't share it. Um, but that's fine. I can deal with that. But I'd hate to have been sort of 18 or 21 and sort of having no kind of celebration that seems a shame that is a real concern that is going to be locked down forever i've been avoiding uh, listening to some of the news because it's just negative 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 and it doesn't help to put seeds of mind seeds of thought into people's minds sometimes sometimes it's not. I, have, I avoid i have the mainstream the mainstream news i, I just see it the newspapers and the, the bbc and the, and the guardian mm -hmm. and the te telegraph i see them as tools of various organs of, of people yeah. in the in the government or, or higher than that um mm -hmm. and that even if they are independent it's often delivered in such a shrieking hysterical way <laughs> basically what happened was um the government sort of suggested lockdown and then they were shocked they were really shocked at how readily people mm -hmm. just felt imprisoned themselves yeah. um and just, but just followed uh, followed along meekly and um so that the fact that that muscle has been flexed now and the guy may got like a fish face goon like michael Gove, sort of like seeming to enjoy saying you only get one hour for exercise yeah let's make it one hour and you got people like him now can just uh, uh, you know we've internalized that it's okay mm -hmm. like internalization the fat work kind of thing like we are going to be much less surprised if the government suddenly released propaganda of like policemen shadows hanging over people having picnics in parks and saying if you go outside you're going to kill people um it we've given up a lot of civil liberty like a hell of a lot um in like yeah. two weeks so, sort of voluntarily really with a few it, promptings um, from it is a bit odd there are some things about it that are really quite peculiar um, I actually had the swine flu back in December 2009. Before I knew you, I was a classroom teacher then. And that was, rough. Yeah, and that was uh, I had five weeks off work. It was over the Christmas period. I'd never been off sick before. So it was um, some of that was like the two weeks sort of natural Christmas, New Year shutdown. And I remember how unwell I was. But, you know, I stayed at home. Obviously, I wasn't physically capable of going out. Um, I don't know something about this whole lockdown thing that is 
it is peculiar. Um, and if it's going to come back in waves, then I'm starting to think, certainly for kids and schools, I'm not sure how they're going to manage this. If we're now living on this virtual online world, there's just so much that's lost. It's great to see your face. That's good. I, I agree. It's a, it's, a, it's terrible free. It's a terrible trap as well as a terrible as well as a great freedom. Yeah. This whole yeah. the the, machi the the machines in general and um, intelligent computers and as we go forward AI. It's yeah. I, yeah it's, it's, I heard someone say they they think our revolutionary role is to is to create the um, AI super genius, which we have. Like, like computers can beat people at chess and do maths that a thousand mm -hmm. people can in a room in a second. So that our role yeah. is to like to build something greater than ourselves, kind of thing. Um, anyway, we're getting a bit we're getting a bit esoteric, and um, <laughs> we are a little bit. We are a little um, So if, if if things go back to totally normal, like so, you imagine the whole thing never happened, and the whole public panic never happened, and the whole hysteria never happened, and the whole virus which it is a serious virus. Let me just I do think that like I'm not dismissing it by any means, but if things go back to normal. Have you got any thoughts on how, again, taking this out of the equation, how the mental health of teachers and students can be improved in general? How it can be improved if we come out of this and it goes back to normal? Um... Looking on the bright side. <laughs> I guess it's going to have to be a case of really open talking and lessons learned and what we can do to the kind of things that you would do, as a, particularly as a primary teacher, I'm going to talk about, you know, about being nice to each other, caring, sharing, all those kind of things that you see. Again, I'm thinking of the playground, you know, where someone takes the ball and runs off with it and then you have to go as the teacher on the break duty to say, now, now we're going to share, we're going to be kind to each other and nice to each other. Yeah, yeah. It to be some of that. There might need to be more of that kind of I know uh, schools like the term intervention but there might need to be more of that because um we just need to make sure that that children are well in school and cared for and loved for and I should think teachers are also having some mental health issues in in dealing with this yeah but uh, I mean just um sorry it was, it was kind of I, I sort of rushed into the question but taking the disease out of the question totally mm -hmm. um okay. In an ordinary world where there wasn't a pandemic, or what could be done by oh. the powers, the powers that be, to, to ease the strain that you, that you see so palpably on teachers' faces when you're in schools? <laughs> yeah, there is a strain on teachers' faces. Um, the whole uh, well, today is interesting because it would be the first day of the SATs tests starting, and of course, there's right. a thing about oh, the SATs, the SATs, the SATs, and now. Oh, so, sorry. Yeah. Can you unpack that just for anyone not in England? What are the, what are okay. the SATs? They are the stat statutory tests that are taken by year six uh, in primary school. So that's age 10 or 11. Uh, English, math, science, I believe. Um, it's been a while since I've been involved in that. And children are tested. And then that those marks get sent to the secondary school. Of course, that's a waste of time because secondary schools do their own baseline, te baseline testing and start again. And actually, it's really a reflection on, on the school rather than the kids. Some parents choose to keep their kids off it because they think it's too much stress. Uh, it's pressure for schools for them to do really, really well. So for some schools, they'll be quite happy about the lockdown because if they had a difficult year six or a year six that was struggling, then they're going to have to worry about the SATs tests. And I actually do know somebody who's quite happy about that. So, yeah, today would be the first day. There'd be a big hype about it, a big build-up. There would have been a build-up since year five. That's another thing to consider. There might be some kids that actually feel quite sad about not taking their tests because they might have really been working extra hard for it. They might have had private tutors or they might have had, you know, their parents really supporting them at home or older brothers and sisters, and they could actually be feeling quite down because for them it could be their moment to shine, particularly if yeah. they hold that they're kind of gifted and talented and they're good at all this kind of stuff, they could be feeling yep. really quite down about that now. Um, I've met plenty of hyper-conscientious kids who would fit that description. Yeah, who, yeah uh, absolutely. Like, some kids identify with music, some of them with the video games, and some of them with success in the in the school. Yeah, yeah right. so, right. so they're not sitting their official tests. Um, I'm sure schools are doing something to cover that. Um, 
But in terms of mental health and well-being, it's the government needs to do something to support teachers in understanding how they can support children. Um, it can't be in the school that I'm teaching music and that's all I'm teaching and then off I go. I need to have a caring nature. You would think as a musician that I would have, hopefully, but to have that caring nature and to spot things in children. Um, obviously, there's a, a lot of training that we do in regards to safeguarding, which is, you know, very important. But how do you safeguard against what's going on in here and trying to help children understand that? I'm sure they could do with some meditation. I remember being at school and we would sit quietly and that was quite yeah. a lot to do. And it might seem a bit far-fetched, but if we could introduce some of that perhaps into schools at a really young age, of it being a real kind of practising, of trying to do something, of still in yeah. our minds, still in the chatter and the nonsense, that could be really... Well, it's, the most, it's the most important thing I've ever learned, you know, that, and, it's, and it's not taught in school. And it's and like you say, just I, to do it sometimes if the class was a bit rowdy. I made the mistake of saying, just focus on your breath to like six-year-olds and obviously they're like... <gasps> <laughs> so I, yes. so I had to start pointing at the behaviour chart and be like, mm -hmm. sensibly, let's focus on our breath quietly. And then they did it in like 20 seconds even. And the, the homeostasis is sort of restored and their equilibrium and like you say, they're calmer. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Instead, we ram their heads to bursting point full of information, most of which that's they won't so be true. That is, no, that's absolutely so, so true. And the thing is, you know, if you're teaching, you want fast paced lessons because you want to move it on. And that's part of the things that, you know, if you were being observed, whether it's by Ofsted or whether by another teacher, you know, you wouldn't want this kind of dead air or dead space where it looks like kids are learning nothing. But actually, yeah. what you just said is, how can we turn that around so that actually children are learning something, even though it looks like, from, from looks. But looks can be deceiving, right? Things are not always what they seem. Yes. What do you think about homeschooling? I think homeschooling is actually a really good idea. Um, I think if you can get together a small network that would uh, help support that sort of homeschooling, like I say, where you could just go out into a, a park or somewhere and you find leaves and you find snails and you find all sorts and some kind of nature trail and joining up with other families, I think, is important. And I think homeschooling actually um, can be, when it's done right, it can, it's really... When it's done right, yeah. yeah. Well, I shouldn't say, yeah. I say when it's done right, what is right or wrong, but... It's about making sure that you're really developing that whole child. In fact, if you remember at that uh, job that we had in Newham, we had the orchestra there, which you were brilliant yeah. in the fashion department. I know that's not where you wanted to be, perhaps, but anyway, um, I don't know if you I remember. To hit things. <laughs> Quite a few of the kids were homeschooled, actually in the percussion department, because they were homeschooled. They didn't really get a chance to learn a musical instrument, so they would come to us and say, oh, wow, you know, I, I want to do something. So I used to send them straight to you, to the percussion department. Um, and they were homeschooled. So that was that yeah. was the way of then obviously being with other children and, and learning. It was, it was good. It was good fun. It was. I remember the, the most um, impressive, impressive tone of speaking and way of speaking that got through to children. I saw you do one day. And you only did it once, which is just... You did it deliberately <laughs> once. Don't you? you sort of okay. sat them all down and you start talking a bit like a kid. You're like, when, when I was a little girl, my mummy said, and, I, and just all the, the way all their eyes just switched on, um, attention wise. Never seen that, never seen that mm -hmm. um, emulated. So well done with that. That'll be your decades uh, decades in the game. Oh, By I the way, just, just to point <laughs> to you and to people listening, Skype is being a bit jumpy, but all anyone has now is Skype and even. Douglas Murray is being interviewed and Skype, Skype's lagging a few seconds here. And if it's really bad, we'll just use the audio. But um, I think the video will be fine because the audio is always fine. And we just occasionally get a few seconds probably doing that. Okay. <laughs> I look, I look, I look at a bit, um, I look at a bit um, peculiar. So how are things for you on the ground? You what, are you what are you working? You were telling me yesterday there was Westminster. Can you elaborate on that? The, was it Westminster, Westminster University? West London. No, West, West London. Sorry. So 
Uh, I'm an examiner for London College of Music Exams, uh, which is the music department of, or the examination department of London College of Music, which is the music department of the University of West London. That's very long worded to say they're an examining board. They've been around since uh, 1890 or 1885, oh dear, I should know, a long time. Um, so I'm an examiner for them, uh, which I really enjoy because I really like to talk about assessment, which is most people, you know, boring for most people, but I find that really quite interesting. Um, certainly for me, when I was learning as a child, that whole progression of using assessment actually really drove me forwards um, to, to want to learn more. So I do that, and I'm also uh, managing director of a company called the International School of Musicians, and that is the company that is helping to bring the University of West London's exams online. Okay. I didn't know the name of the, um, you would imagine, director of the International School of Musicians. I'm going to write that down because <laughs> that, makes you sound, that makes you sound knowledgeable and important. Oh, which is, um, I don't I think need so. More of that. I'm still learning. <laughs> I'm still learning. That's, that's uh, the key, I think, isn't it? It's still learning. Well, it's to realise, yeah, yeah, because that's the only logical conclusion to draw from realising how little you know. <laughs> so yeah. 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 Uh, All I'm saying, that, I think, like, meditation and stuff like that, the most important part of it is is unlearning. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes, absolutely. Unlearning. Yeah. Unconditioning I, yourself, yeah. I think. It's true. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I'm a big fan of meditation. I try and do it every morning. Uh, and I always know when I haven't done it later on in the day because I just feel if, I don't know, I just yeah, can, yeah. I can tell. And sometimes I do end up missing something or other, but I try and make it the first thing I do when I get up so that I, before I drink coffee, before I start reading something, before I look at my yeah. phone or do anything silly like that, I try and make that the first thing to do. It sets the day. Yeah, me too. Yeah, me too. With a usually unsuccessful, but last few days I've, I've done it right. Anyway, sorry. So with the University of West London thing, mm -hmm. we're talking 10th of May. Uh, what was going on? The 10th of May. Yeah, I thought you said they were having some kind of. I know you explained the. Um, you were telling me yesterday, which was the 10th. Of May. Oh right, yes. No, I was um, just. I'm helping them. I do it. Was, oh, okay. Just okay. And you had to rush off to do it. Just because you, you were in a rush. I thought you went there was some kind of crisis. <laughs> oh, no, 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 uh, not exactly. But there is a lot, a lot to do. Um, and I took a, about two hours off yesterday uh, and actually spent that time weeding the garden, which I actually really enjoy doing. That's actually a type of meditation. That sounds bizarre, yeah. but I'm actually quite happy doing that because I'm just looking at the weeds. Um, yeah. That was yesterday. Well, everything's a meditation if you're paying attention. Literally, yes. literally everything. Yes, that's true. Okay, right. June, if you were, if in a post-pandemic world, um, <laughs> if you were to design a school, what would your top three rules be? My top three rules. Um, yeah, I'm gonna. Say, yeah, I was. As soon as you say rules, I start thinking of behaviour and stuff like that. My principles would be that um, every Every moment is an opportunity to learn. Right. I, um, my second one would be um, schools already use this anyway. They refer to it as cross curricular. So if you were learning a topic about the Romans, you know how can how can that be related to geography? How can that be related to music? How can that be related to science? So I definitely want a real joined up cross-curricular approach so if I if a child is learning to play the trumpet right how can this relate to other things that we learn in school rather than it being separate I am learning to play the trumpet it needs to the subjects need to speak to each other and I think the third one would be um definitely about a stopping and a thinking whether you call that meditation or not a stopping and a thinking of awareness of everything um, who we are, how we can be better all the time. Uh, yeah. That sounds a bit airy fairy. It sounds a bit woo woo, but a, a kind of stopping and a thinking. And it is a little bit like meditation. But it, I'm not trying to go into some enlightenment mode. But if we can get this into children at a young age to stop and think 
and just be aware of everything that is around us. I guess that would be my yeah. principles. That's great. That reminds me of the Simpsons scene where um, Lisa <laughs> walks into the Buddhist center and uh, she's like, Lenny and Carl are there. Lenny and Carl, you're Buddhist. And then there's, there's a famous actor, who, I can't remember his name is, and um, she goes, oh, Mr. So, Mr. X. And um, he he opened his eyes and he goes, oh, hi, uh, I was just about to attain enlightenment, but who'd want that? <laughs> oh, we could all do with it. It would be amazing. We should all be going into some other strength. Hopefully that's what this can bring for us all. Yeah, yeah. Right, June, I've got two more questions for you, if that's cool, because I know, I know you're busy um, keeping, no. the, keeping the education system afloat. Um, do you have, so for any parents watching out there mm -hmm. who have kids in schools, primary or secondary or um, whatever they call it in other countries of any age, what mm -hmm. advice would you give to parents on how to deal with schools? I know that's a vague question, but what, what kind of tone would you ask, would you advise them to take with schools? During this pandemic? Or just yes, to... and going forward, yeah. Um, what kind of tone? Okay, this is going to... Hmm, okay, maybe I would suggest um, to get involved in what your children are learning. Perhaps that's easier at primary, and I am continuously going to refer to a lot of stuff primary-wise, but really get involved in what your children are being taught at school. And how Primary is 10 years old and under, by the way, just people who know, yes. 11 years old sometimes. Yeah. That's it, 11 years old and under. Um, yes, yeah, so get involved in what they're learning. How can you um, support that learning at home? Rather than what the teachers are telling you, oh, here is... Can, this is the book we're reading. This you've got to do your reading at home. Oh, we're doing this in maths. You've got to do this at home. Just looking at broader concepts of how you can be that additional teacher to your child, because actually you are the first teacher. We are a product yeah. of parents. I am. I often say things, and I realise I say it, and I think, oh, that's my mum. That's totally what <laughs> mum would say. And then I'll have another moment where I'll do something and I think oh that's the sort of thing my dad would have done and so we are the first port of call for children um as teachers so it's important that we try and maybe not just oh they've gone off to school I'll lead the school to it you know I'll do the bits that I need to I'm not saying parents are not being parents but broadening that role right yes broadening the role and and amalgamating it more into the into what's going on at school and then what they're asked to do by teachers when they're at yes. home. Yes, how you can broaden that. Okay. Um, and uh, that guess my last question for you would be, are there any young people out there watching sort of 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, obviously probably taking the pandemic in mind. Um, mm -hmm. You've been in education at, very, at various levels to, decades and in, 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 in the highest levels of, of organizations what advice would you give to students themselves in terms of how to um how to stay on an even keel stay reasonably happy and do well in school um try and there's a wealth of information out there uh I've been so impressed with how the British Library have put their collections online and um, the South Bank Centre, which is um, a nice place that I like to visit in London, um, which is a cultural um, centre, how they've put things online. I mean, there's lots of things, there's lots of ways that you can access this stuff online. But I would say as much as you can, try not to spend too much time looking at things on a screen online before you start to think that that's reality because it isn't totally agree from my youtube channel but yes i genuinely say moderate screen use moderate screen use. yeah and i'm not talking you know just from like oh don't keep going on instagram don't keep going on tiktok because i like tiktok it makes me laugh i'm actually saying even the things that you're studying and learning online you're gonna have to shut that down and look around the room that you're in just yeah just look yes get away from it it's um I had a poem about it saying, like, if you phone 
with it, it it traps your eyes with the narrowest of shackles to the vastest of oceans. Wow. Um, that's what it feels like. It's a very constricted feeling looking at your phone compared to, like you say, sunlight or um, let alone outside, which is a taboo these days. But um, anyway, Julia, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it in there because I like I know you've got to get off, and I've got to. Um, I'm, I'm staying at my friend's house in the countryside, and I've commandeered the living room for this uh, <laughs> this video. She's waiting very patiently. Well, we'll see how patient how patiently she was waiting actually. Okay. But, Anyway, thank you, thank you very, very much. Um, oh, do, you have, you. do you have any, do you have anything in the public domain that you want to that you want to plug? <laughs> in the public domain, um, you can visit the website. It's still being put together, so this is a new company. It's www.internationalschoolofmusicians.org. O R G, um, and uh, it's uh, like I say, it's a work in progress. It's a new company. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, exciting times. Yes, that's it's that's it's it's not boring. Um, give that although it's maybe, maybe it's so boring that it's painful, which makes it not boring anymore. That's that's how the lockdown's been a, a little bit for me. All right, June. Um, take it easy, guys. Thanks for watching. This has been June, uh, most distinguished guest and someone I respect a lot, and um, was was a very good boss and. Probably got me out of trouble a few times and um, <laughs> into trouble a few times. Uh, June, have a wonderful day with, I uh, hope, Frank as well. And and um, just take it easy and keep keep up the good the good work. Thank you. You too, Rob. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.